Hi everyone, I'm Ku'ulani with the Kona Historical Society and thank you for joining us today for Monday with Miley Melrose. So Miley is back and she will be continuing her discussion on uh, historic Kailua Village. So enjoy, thanks for joining. Aloha. Ta-da! Hey, it is me, Miley, with Mondays with Miley here. <laughs> and we are returning to Henry Nicholas Greenwell's store, which is kind of fun. So behind me, instead of seeing the Western light pouring down on our faces, we now have replicas of all the canned goods that Mr. Greenwell was selling here in the store in the 1880s and 1890s. So that is kind of good fun. But that is not our topic for today. We are returning to historic Kailua Village, Kamakahonu, and the white sands of Kai Akea Pua Beach, the Sea of the God. Thank you, Facebook people, for giving me little comments like, when I do it wrong, let me know. So that's okay. So I'm just going to hold this up, and I think when I hold up pictures to you, they come out backwards like a mirror, which is not great, and you just kind of have to figure it out, which is sad. But just to refresh your memories, this is Kailua Village as it looked in 1850, maybe 1852. And you can see over here by this finger, uh, the big stone walls of Kamehameha the Great's home, Kamakahonu, the Eye of the Turtle. And today we're gonna talk about why we have the White Sand Beach, and then over here we have Hulihe'e Hale, and behind it, Mokuaikawa Church. So, over here, Kamakahonu, this is Kamehameha the First, and over here we have change. We have history, we have time passing, we have human beings. But, we don't want to race too far into the future because 1819, and 1820 were so very interesting. So if you remember, we were talking about the death of Kamehameha the Great in 1819, the, I guess, accession. Remember, we were standing on the sands, and we had Ka'ahumanu, we had all the chiefs standing in the water, and we had Liho Liho coming out in his English military uniform with his feather cloak on and his helmet being accepted as the king and Ka'ahumanu as his Kuhina Nui. Then we had to have the battle, we had to squelch the old religion because we had the we, ha, Liho Liho and Ka'ahumanu and his mother Keopuo Lani. They had sat down with his little brother, Kaukeaole, who will be the future Kamehameha III, and they had eaten together men and women out of the same bowl from the same table, the Ainoa. So everything is different. But we've had the battle, he's taken over, the kingdom is united, and what's going to happen? This is why history is very interesting. While Liho Liho is getting rid of one religion, another religion is in a boat getting ready to come to Hawaii. And this is a big deal. And this would be exactly 200 years ago. So here we are, we are in 2020. In 1820, a little tiny boat, a brig, the Thaddeus, is beating its way from Boston Harbor, you know, down the coast of South America, through the Straits of Magellan, up across the Pacific, and coming to the island of Hawaii. Because Liho Liho is the king. And everybody knows, I don't know how they know this, but if you want to get off your boat and be a missionary and come live in Hawaii, you are going to have to have the king's permission because he is in charge. And so that is what is happening. So 1819, 1820, and another little bunch of boats are beating their way into the Pacific. Not just the missionaries, but we have the whale ships. 1819, 1820, this is gonna be the first time English American whale ships are gonna come into the Pacific in a big deal, and they're gonna to come to Hawaii, and they are going to like what they find, because Hawaii is going to be such a handy dandy port in the middle of the Pacific. And if you wanna go up north to the Bering Sea, 
and catch whales. You don't want to be up there in the winter time because you'll get stuck in the ice and you could die. So you want to come back down. And this is the beginning of a long and kind of tortured relationship, probably, between whale ships and Hawaii, which is exacerbated by the presence of the missionaries. But you just have to think about that. Whale ships, catching whales, lots of sailors on board who really want to see Hawaiian ladies. But then you have to think about missionaries who really don't want sailors and ladies getting together because they're all about the Ten Commandments and you just marry one woman and it caused problems. It caused a lot of problems. But we don't have to worry about that because we are here in Kailua. So, the missionaries, the Thaddeus, set sail and you think to yourself, okay, why did the missionaries want to come to Hawaii? It's not like they just sat down and got a pin and poked it on the globe of the world. They were inspired. They were inspired by a young, wonderful, intelligent, dedicated Hawaiian man called Henry Opukahaia, who was born here on the big island. His parents were killed in a battle of Kamehameha the Great. And he is down at you know, Kealakikua Bay. He's been trained to be a Hawaiian priest at Hikiau Heiau. And something about this just doesn't sit well with him. And he swims out into the harbor onto another New England sea captain ship. So you can tell once Captain Cook discovers Hawaii, Hawaii is open to these boats coming. That's the only way you can get here. You have to be on a big boat. And the only big boats that are coming here well, they're Americans, they're Europeans, they're English, they're Russians. But in this case, it was an American sea captain. And young Henry swam out on board the ship and was weeping and said he really wanted to go back with the sea captain. And he ends up going back to the East Coast, getting converted to Christianity and inspiring a huge religious movement to get, get a band of missionaries and let them come back to Hawaii. And of course, Henry Opukahaia was supposed to be on board the brig Thaddeus. That was the plan, to have him be part of this very small band of young people. I lived with a lady once who was um, dedicated, she was descended from missionaries. I am not descended from missionaries. But she said, Miley, think of them as the Peace Corps. They're very young, they're very idealistic, they don't really know what they're getting into, but they've set a very high standard for themselves and they're trying very hard to live up to it. And that's what's happened. So all these young people are on board the Brig Thaddeus and they have such high rules for themselves that nobody can get on board this boat to come to Hawaii unless they're married. And lots of these young men have been so busy being at theological colleges and studying so hard that they don't even know any girls. They don't know anybody. And so they have helpful relatives who basically set them up to get married to young religious women who are ready to dedicate themselves to God and to saving the heathen. This is the language of the time because they believed if you were not saved, if you were not a Christian, then you were going to go to hell probably. And it wasn't going to be pleasant. So they wanted to save everybody. That was fine. That was a perfectly good idea. One... See, this is going to be one of our heroes of the day. One of those young missionaries wrote a book. And I'm just here to say, if you've got an interesting story to tell, write it down, because then we can read it. So, we have young Liho Liho, and now his life is getting more complicated. Because those young people on the Thaddeus, they have, first thing, you know, they beat themselves, they get down here, they pass Kauai High, and they're coming down the coastline, and... Of course, a chief is down there at Kwai Hai and his queen. And they are very interested in this boat. And they are interested in the women, because this is a big deal. It's the first time you have white American ladies on the boats, because most of the ships that come to Hawaii have always had men on them. And they, everyone's very curious. What are white ladies like? What do they wear? What's their hair? What are those funny hats they have? They look like they have long skinny necks and this terrible style of bonnet in 1820. It's very pokey looking and it's just weird, weird, weird. And so at Kwai Hai, a chiefess gets on board the ship 
and I think this is actually very adorable. There is a sewing party. Okay, so I have to find this for you because it's so cute. This is a book. See, I'm blacking out my face so you can see it. This book is called Life of Lucy O. Thurston. The Life of Lucy O. Thurston. And she was the wife of Asa Thurston, who is the first ordained minister put in Kailua Kona all by themselves. And so she gets off the Thaddeus in 1820 with her husband Asa and with, well, the, everybody has to come off first to see Liho Liho and Kamamalu and to get introduced to all the chiefs. But in the end, Hiram Bingham takes most of the missionaries off to Honolulu. But who gets to stay behind? Asa and Lucy, just the two of them, they've just gotten married, and Lucy and Dr. Thomas Holman. Another great book. Another great book. Nine Nine Doctors and God. These are, <laughs> Mr. Holman was, Dr. Holman was not a missionary. These are wonderful books, and these tell us what life was like here in 1820. So, but I have to read you this thing about being on the ship. <laughs> yes, this is good fun. So here, they've arrived at Kwai Hai. This is good. And Kalani Moku is down there. Remember Kalani Moku, the iron cable? He is the one who led the battle against Kekua Ukalani down there at Kuomo'o. This is this amazingly strong, politically savvy man. He's down at Kwai Hai, and he's dining with all the missionaries, eating as others ate. The Hawaiian ladies didn't really want to eat um, with all the missionaries. They didn't want to sit down at the table. I mean, who knows? After we rose from table, they had their own food brought on, raw fish and poi, and they ate it with their fingers. So probably that's, they didn't want to eat what the missionaries were eating. From Kwai Hai, the chiefs and their large retinue all sailed with us to Kailua, where the king resided. They all slept on deck on their mats while passing in the gray evening between two rows of native men in Hawaiian costume, the climax of queer sensations was reached. Okay, so Lucy Thurston is a very sheltered young New England lady and she has never been on a boat with <laughs> a whole bunch of men lying on the decks and she's having to walk past their bodies in the gray evening. And this is very cute. This is Kekua Okalani, um, this is Kalani Moku, one of his wives, is Kalakua. So she is on board the boat too. Kalakua brought a web of white cambric to have a dress made for herself in the fashion of those of our ladies and was very particular in her wish to have it finished while sailing along the western side of the island before reaching the king. And what I love about this story is the men missionaries are all busy thinking about Bibles and meeting the king and getting permission. And the wives of the missionaries are very busy thinking about needles and thread and scissors and let's get some fabric. And how are we going to make a white cambric dress for a queen? So this is the next morning. Can you believe it? So this is in Lucy Thurston's book. She's just adorable. She wakes up on board the ship with all the Hawaiian men sleeping on the mats upstairs. Monday morning, April 3rd. Okay, this is 200 years ago. We're just off, you know, we're May 4th. We're just off a month from 200 years. The first sewing circle was formed that the sun ever looked down upon in the Hawaiian realm. Ah, the first sewing circle. Kalakua, Queen Dowager, was directress. She requested all the seven white ladies to take seats with them on mats on the deck of the Thaddeus. Mrs. Holman and Mrs. Ruggles were executive officers to ply the scissors and prepare the work. As the sisters were very much in the habit of journalizing, all these little ladies like to write in their books, everyone was a self-constituted recording secretary. So I guess those ladies are sitting there writing down these details. 
The four native women of distinction were furnished with calico patchwork to sew, a new employment for them. The dress was made in the fashion of 1819. The length of the skirt accorded with Brigham Young's rule to his Mormon damsels, quote, have it come down to the tops of the shoes, unquote. But in this queen's case, where the shoes were wanting, the bare feet cropped out very prominently. Well, I love this. So they're on board the Thaddeus and the sun is beating down on them and they're all sitting on the deck of the ship and they are making, they're sewing, they're sewing together. What I like about this is they're not speaking the same language. They are not eating the same food, but they are creating bonds you know, bonds of respect, bonds of friendship, and maybe they're even laughing. Maybe they're having a good time. So they get down there, April 4th, 163 days from Boston. The Thaddeus was anchored before Kailua. So here we are in this bay that we've been talking about outside Kamakahonu in you know how Kailua is. It's not a large bay. If the Thaddeus is out there anchored, we are all going to see it. Everybody in Kona is going to see it. The Queen Dowager Kalakua assumed a new appearance. In addition to her newly made white dress, her person was decorated with a lace cap, having on a wreath of roses and a lace half handkerchief, a neckerchief in the corner of which was a most elegant sprig of various colors. They were presents we had brought her from some American friends. When she went ashore, she was received by hundreds with a shout. Okay, so she is a very high-born lady. Everybody knows who she is. And she is dressed up in presents that the missionary women have brought on purpose. These people knew they were coming to a Hawaiian kingdom. They they thought it was their job to convert everybody, but they are thrilled to death because A, number one, they don't have to convert everybody. They thought the religion was going to be going when they got here, but it isn't. And I have to think that's got to be a huge sense of relief to at least the missionary wives that their husbands don't have to go out and actually you know, bash down idols or do, you know, do things they've never done before. They don't have to go there. They can dress up queens. Isn't this fun? So hundreds of people are there on the shoreline, lining up in the sand. They give a tremendous shout to see one of their chiefesses come ashore. And then here goes Captain Blanchard. He has brought the Thaddeus from Boston. And then we have the missionaries, Bingham and Thurston. And with one of the Hawaiian boys, there are three Hawaiian Christians who have been back in the East Coast, they've all been going to that same school that Henry Opukahayo was going to, and too bad he dies, and these three others come with the missionaries, and they are high hopes because they can speak Hawaiian, they know the Bible, they understand New England ways. They're gonna be very, very useful. And, they, and this is only, you know, the Hawaiian queens get to go ashore, but the white ladies have to stay on the deck. They are not allowed off the boat. So, the men have run off and they want to find the king. And they found him eating dinner with his five wives, all of them in the free, cool undress of native disabi. Well, what they mean is they weren't dressed up, were they? No, two of his wives were his sisters and one the former wife of his father. And this is Lucy Thurston. So I, I don't know if that's true or not, but who knows. After completing their meal, four of the wives with apparent sisterly affection and great pleasure turned to a game of cards. As was the custom, one wife was ever the close attendant of her regal lord. So and I think I think Lucy is writing this with approval. She understands this. She thinks this is a good idea. And here's Hopu. So here's our Hawaiian interpreter. Hopu then introduced Messieurs Bingham and Thurston as priests of the Most High God who made heaven and earth. So this is a big deal. This is the moment, basically, he could be interesting 
introducing Kahuna, but he, you know, Hopu is, Hopu is smart. He says, okay, these are the priests of the Most High Lord. The letters were then read to the king from Dr. Worcester from Boston and from the prudential committees and the object for which they came to live among them was explained. And then the visitors had to retire, leaving the subject for royal consideration. So this is one of those momentous moments that's put in front of Liho Liho as a young king. Here is a band of missionaries and they want to come. They're asking permission to live in the Hawaiian kingdom. And they say one year, let us try one year among you. And the king he doesn't have any idea what a band of missionaries could do or be. But he is very, very influenced by Kalani Moku again. Kalani Moku already got baptized, you can't believe it, as a Roman Catholic in 1819 aboard a French ship. And he is all for the missionaries. And so he, you know, they have seen him at Kauai High and he tells the young king, this is a good thing. This is going to be good for our nation. And so the king allows them to disembark and to unpack their goods. And this is the beginning of Lucy, of course, has a lot of social change and culture to deal with. And she does a very, very good job. This lady is fantastic because it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for the Hawaiians, I am sure, to have to adjust their behavior to these kind of crazy New England ideas, but it wasn't easy for the wives. These, these ladies from New England who are wearing too many clothes and they have to wash the too many clothes there isn't any water in Kailua, and they're used to things like milk, and butter, and cheese, which doesn't exist in Hawaii, and they're all going to get pregnant and not feel great and have to have babies far away from home and their mothers and fathers. So I just wanted, I'm going to, this is a great book, if you need to borrow it from the library if you ever want to, Lucy Thurston, but I'm just going to read you the intro because I pulled this book out and I was just touched. It's so, my book is so old, it's um, falling apart. But this is a picture of Lucy in her old age. So of course, it's a black and white drawing and she's old and tons of her children, her husband, grandchildren have died. Pioneer missionary to the Sandwich Islands, but she writes in this just darling way about writing this book. Because of course, she didn't come to Hawaii to be a, a writer, but she writes, um, she writes, in little tiny print, she writes on this page, now wrapped in the folds of age, of widowhood, of solitude and infirmities, I feel the great importance of independent resources of happiness. In the fear of God, I said, what wilt thou have me do? my mind turned to the writings which had accumulated beneath my hand. My physical and mental powers are equal to extracting and arranging a volume from the mass. It is the only legacy I can leave my children and grandchildren. The only way I can warn and lighten and cheer the future daughters of our country who engage in the missionary enterprise it is the only remaining service I can do for the public by whose contributions I have been sustained all these years. It is an expression of thanks to the, of course, to God the Father. Yes, and so you see, Lucy, people have asked her, oh, Mrs. Thurston, please write a book. In the silence and solitude of night, with my study lamp, I took the writings of 1819. I read and reread them. Thus engaged, I was lost in reverie. I was young again. She's only 21 when she gets out here. She is only 21 years old. I was young again and I saw my father's family surrounding me, so loving and so lovely. Many, many noble friends had assembled with them, all happy and exuberant. I too 
It appeared to me a grand jubilee, so real, so near they all seemed, that when about to open these lips to speak to them in an easy manner, a thrill went through me. These friends have all outstripped me in the race. They have become as the angels of light. I alone am left in the wilderness, but happy, so happy that it was long that night before I could sleep. Ah! Then the dim eyes of 1872 turned back and fastened upon the vigor and bloom of 1819, first driven, then drawn to the work of life supplement. Oh my goodness. It is my dying bequest to the living when I shall have passed beyond the reach of censure and applause. Meantime, while alone, walking the shady vale, preparing its passages, I shall admit to my bosom the solace that she hath done what she could. Lucy Thurston, she wrote this November 8th, 1872. So, I hooray for you, Lucy Thurston, because I think that was really, really good. Oh, that's me making a crashing sound. Because, yes, what I wanted to do is make you realize in a very strange way that Lucy Thurston and her husband Asa Thurston and Liho Liho and this other um, wonderful, there's another wonderful missionary who came along and his story is going to help us tell the Kailua story is there's another thing there's another book William Ellis this is William Ellis and he's an English missionary he's an English missionary at 21 years of age William Ellis and his wife go off to Tahiti and they spend four, five years in Tahiti, bringing the Christianity to the Tahitians. He was poor, he grew up in England, poor, poor, poor. And that's why you're 21 and you get sent as a missionary out into Tahiti, because that's not an easy thing to do. But you have these young people all together. Don't think of these missionaries and the rulers of Hawaii as you know, kind of old and wise. They're all young. I like it, they're all young, they're all learning. They're actually very, they're curious and they're interested in what is going on. Okay, so we have all these missionaries here and we have these whalers coming in. And I want you to know one of these whalers is, oh, sorry, I just wiggled it, don't worry. One of these whalers is Captain Valentine Starbuck from Nantucket, a little island off the coast of New England in the Atlantic Ocean. And Nantucket is a little island, but it is famous, famous, famous for sea captains, in particular, whaling captains. So you have to just close your eyes and think, oh yes, mm, Moby Dick, you know, ooh la la. Yes, Nantucket, that is the land of Captain Ahab and Queek Queek and all these people. But this is a real captain, Captain Valentine Starbuck. And his name is going to crop up because we are going to be talking right now, 1819, 1820 to 1823. So when the missionary ladies first arrive in Kailua, so we're going to have Lucy Thurston is there, and the doctor, Mrs. Holman, is there. And all the other missionaries go off to Honolulu, because that's, it's, Honolulu is growing. But Liho Liho is still attached to the capital of his father, so he has not decided yet that he has to move to Honolulu. But he will shortly, and the missionaries will have to go with him, because they just, they have to go where he goes. So we have Lucy and Mrs. Holman left behind. But good fun, Captain Valentine Starbuck comes into Kailua and he is most surprised to see two white ladies living on the rocky shores of Kailua. Because let me tell you, Kailua had rocky shores. Mr. S um, Sawkins makes Kailua look all fantastic. But actually Kailua, let's see, this is, this is the wrong, you shouldn't be looking at this. Kailua looks, if you're, down in Kailua, looking up at Hualalai, that's our mountain, Hualalai. Isn't this an interesting etching? This is a drawing done by Asa and Lucy Thurston's daughter, 
Persis. She drew it and then it was engraved at Lahaina Luna at the Missionary Printing Press place and it shows the Thurston's house. They live in this house, that great big grass house behind a stone wall. Here's the trail coming from Kailua. These are all the Ulu trees growing here in the Ulu belt. Up here is Hualalai. Here's King Kamehameha's garden, Kuaheva, the enclosure. Probably the whole thing is Kuaheva. And you just see little plants, little plants, little rocks. And down here, look how barren this is. This is on the way to Kailua. And it's, it's rocks. It's lava. It is very barren and hot. And so the Thurstons chose to live out in the very hot, barren part of Kailua. And so Mr. Uh, Captain Starbuck comes along with presents like a bottle of wine, which I'm sure Lucy Thurston would never touch that. But Mrs. Holman did because she was in need of revivifying. And she liked wine and her husband liked wine. They were not missionaries. They weren't breaking any law by doing this. But so that is Kailua. And it's got, I wanted to show you this other picture of it, if I find it, just so you can get the really desolate feeling of Kailua. The missionaries arrive, and the first thing is the ladies are just sad. There's no water. There are some coconut trees. There are some very beautiful, um, of course they're coconut trees, and they're ko trees. Yeah, this, um, this, I don't know how well this is going to show up. But this is Kailua. In fact, now that I'm looking at this book backwards, <laughs> this is another book. This is a book that's been, the Hawaii Mission Houses published this. And it's the prints that come out of Lahaina Luna's printing press and most of the engravers. These are Hawaiian students. These are the missionaries, got the Hawaiian students, took them to Lahaina Luna, and they learned how to carve on copper plates and the cover of this book is Kailua. It is over here, Mokuaikawa Church. And here we have the Blue Pacific. So this is, and you can see all the Hawaiian grass houses. Kailua is a very well populated, it's a village. And it used to have thousands of people. And then unfortunately people started to die. And that's what happens. That's, why, that's one of the themes of today's story. So here we are going up, we're at 34 minutes. Okay, so here we are, Kailua. So we have the missionaries, we have the whale ships, we have Liho Liho has been told by his chiefs, you cannot stick around here in Kailua anymore. You're gonna have to go to Honolulu. You're gonna have to settle down. Apparently he's a very restless chief. He doesn't want to just stay in one place and do his kingly duties probably. He moves around and he kind of frustrates people who are trying to find him. So he gets to Honolulu and he decides, which is really rather an interesting decision on his part, that what he wants to do is go back to England. He wants to go see King George IV and kind of reestablish the relationship that had existed. He knew his father, Kamehameha the Great, had a relationship with Captain George Vancouver, an English naval, he was on the boat, he came out Anyway, 1793, 94, 95. There's a strong relationship between England and Hawaii, and the British have built a beautiful sailing ship for the prince. It's called the Prince Regent. They built it in Australia, and it has sailed up to Hawaii. And interestingly enough, it stops in Tahiti and picks up William Ellis, the man who wrote this book from Tahiti, comes to Hawaii. They will land in Honolulu. William Ellis speaks beautiful Tahitian because he's lived there for five years, so he can speak to the king. The king really likes him. And they say, hey, we want to go to England because we are getting concerned. The word is, you know, their French ships coming, their Russian ships coming. They don't want to be taken over. Hawaii is a sovereign nation and they have a young king. And so they think if we just get England, we don't want to be taken over by anybody, but we want to be protected. So here's Luna Lilo, handsome and young. Remember, he's got the uniform on, the cloaks. He's going to England and he's, missionaries say, well, <laughs> you can't take those five queens with you to England because your job is to look civilized. They, they can't say it like that, but they want him to appear. He could hold his head up in 
the assembly of nations. He's going to Europe. They don't want people to say, why does he have five wives? So he picks his favorite wife, and I want to show you her picture. So she is beautiful. This is a beautiful, beautiful tipus. This is Kamamalu. Kamamalu. And Kamamalu is chosen to accompany her husband to England. And Captain Valentine Starbuck is the one who takes them on the English whaling ship. So they've already met him. They met him in 18. 20 down in Kailua. He's one of those first ships that comes in to see the king. He's been running around hunting for whales. He's actually supposed to be on a whaling ship, but Liho Liho charters his British whaling ship. It's got a French name that I can't say. L apostrophe A I G L E Valer. Yeah, terrible name for a boat. I can't stand it. But anyway, what's interesting to think about is it took the missionaries you know, 160 something days to go from New England around South America to get to Hawaii, it's going to take Liho Liho and Kamamalu just even more time to go from Honolulu down, down, down around South America, up, up, up through the Atlantic and to Portsmouth. Usually these ships arrive at Portsmouth, the British port town on the English Channel. And they did it. They did it. Captain Valentine got them there in good shape and they were all healthy and they were very, very happy. And they were excited because they were going to see King George. And let me tell you, the British government was very excited and they wanted to do it all perfectly. So they had, you know, a special aide de camp, one of their diplomatic corps people come and take charge of the party, which includes Governor Boki and his beautiful wife, Luliha, and, you know, a translator, Jean Reeves, and they take them all to the Caledonian Hotel, which I think is very nice. And they're at the Caledonian Hotel. Yeah, this is notes, right? They arrive on May 18th of 1824. So they left Hawaii in November of 1823. He leaves the kingdom behind. He gives it to Ka'ahu Manu, of course, the Kuhina Nui, and she says, I will be the regent for your little brother, Kamehameha III, Kawikiaole. He's only like 11 years old. He is a little boy. But Liho Liho and Kamamalu, they are going off to see King George, and they get to England. They stay at the Caledonian Hotel. They went to the theater. They sat in the royal boxes. Can you imagine this? I mean, imagine this Kamamalu is not a five foot two girl. She is a six foot tall, imposing, beautiful Hawaiian queen. She is all dressed up. She, she's the kind of girl, the minute she saw the missionaries, she wanted them to make her a dress. This is a gal who likes fashion. And she is described by Lucy, you know, when she wears the roses on her head, that's one thing. But she comes out with my lilies. She wears feather, beautiful, you know, golden headdresses. She, she likes fashion. I just have to think of her enjoying the heck out of London. So they went to the theater. They got taken around by tourists in a beautiful carriage to see all the sights of London, things that visitors are supposed to see. And they were arranging the special meeting when they were going to go and see King George. And then, most unfortunately, they got exposed to the measles. You know, here we are, COVID-19. All you need is one person, one measles infected person somehow got close to the royal party and several of them got sick. So we can't have the meeting with King George. Everybody has to recover. But very, very sadly, you know, and King George, he heard about this. He sent his own physician down to the Caledonian. It's like, please do not have these royal visitors die. Please don't have them die. Well, guess what? Kamamalu dies first of the measles on July 8th. Apparently she had, she was complicated. She had an inflammation of the lungs. Yeah, that was so really, really sad. I'm getting the little message. We have five minutes left. So you think of Kamamalu. She's in London. She has inflammation of the lungs. She dies on the 8th of July. Liho, Liho. Grief stricken and discouraged died on the 14th. The rest of the party recovered. Everybody else recovers. Boki, Liliha, the translator. The English are not fools. They are not putting the bodies of the king and queen of the Sandwich Islands in a whale ship 
and sending them back with Captain Valentine's Starbuck. Starbucks. They get a giant, huge man of war, you know, with 46 cannon and the big sails, and they get a very fancy captain. This is the Blonde. The ship is called the Blonde, and it is Lord Byron's cousin. So Lord Byron's the famous poet, and his cousin who's going to be in charge of this boat and get these bodies safely back with all the pomp and circumstance and honor of the British, you know, of Britain. Nothing's going to touch these coffins, and they're very, very fancy coffins. They get the fanciest coffins known in England, and they put the king and queen, and it's very, very sad. So, Kailua, at this point, you think, what's going on? Um... You know, when you go on a sailing voyage like that and it takes you 160 or 170 or 180 days to get there, maybe they sent a letter back saying, here we are, but the king and queen have died before any letter is ever going to reach Hawaii. So nobody knows really what's going on. And in Kailua, what's going on is probably what, thank goodness, is always going on in Kailua. You know, it's... Who's in Kailua while everybody off is running off going to England? The man who is in Kailua, and this is going to be his house, but not yet. Here's Hulehe'e Hale, is, of course, Kuakini, Ka'ahu Manu's brother. When the decision is made that Liholiho and his entire court has to move to Honolulu, who is going to be in charge of the island of Hawaii? Ka'ahu Manu. <laughs> I don't know if she suggested to Liho Liho or it's just obvious. Kuakini is the man. He wants to stay in Kailua. It's his island and he's highly capable. He is a highly capable person. So, our Kona is doing fine. While the king is off getting the measles, Kona is just fine. And what's happened in this time is Asa and Lucy Thurston have had to go to Honolulu. They've had to go to Honolulu to be where the king is. When Mr. Ellis shows up in 1823, the king says, all right, now you can send some missionaries back to Kailua, because nobody's been there. Asa and Lucy Thurston had to go to Honolulu. Now they volunteer. They want to go back to Kailua. That was their first mission station. They want to go back to the people. Mr. Thurston has learned how to speak Hawaiian. He has had church services already in Kailua. So Mr. Ellis is sent with, they're gonna have a little tiny exploring party that is coming back to the big island. They are going to go all the way around the island of Hawaii and pick a place to put the station. I'm sure Mr. Um, Thurston, the Reverend Asa Thurston is thinking, please, please let it be Kailua because for crying out loud, I was there already. But you never know, so I'm gonna close we're getting to the end, and I forgot to say, if you're just tuning in, this is <laughs> Miley Melrose with the Kona Historical Society. But I want to show you this map, just because I hope you realize we are in the old-fashioned times, right? This is a map of the island of Hawaii that Mr. Ellis is using. It's in his book. This map is taken from George Vancouver. So George Vancouver was out here in the 1790s. And he made a map. And so, the, but the, I love it. I mean, here's this book. It comes out in the 1820s. It goes, Ho Ho Map of Hawaii Improved from Vancouver's Survey. All right, one minute. Okay, so history's all around us. Why do we need explorers? Why do we need history? It's because we need things like maps. We need to have some dates. We need to know what's going on. So next week, we're going to be in Kailua, and we are going to talk Pretty much. So it's really sad. Liho Liho is, he's dead. His beautiful queen is dead. And I'm sad about that because he came from, he's, he is our king who was crowned. He wasn't really crowned, but he was turned into the king in Kailua. And we don't have another king like that. That's it. So this is going to be, we are going to talk about William Ellis. William Ellis. I love William Ellis. And he would have stayed and lived in Hawaii till his dying day. But his wife is not well here. This is what happens. People get sick. Death comes and knocks on the door and lots of people who could have been productive and really helped. Liho Liho should have come back to Hawaii. It's a great tragedy, honestly, that he didn't make it. 
Okay, I have a sneaky feeling. Now it's time to say aloha, Facebook fans. I hope you're fans. Ooh, I forgot to ask you have any questions. <laughs> you can always send your questions in, you know, and we could answer them next week if you had a big question. And mahalo to the person who pointed out it is Sea of the God. You're right, it's Sea of the God. Kai Akeakua, not the gods. That was a boo-boo. Okay, au revoir.